Hello, and welcome to the Slate Political Gab Fest. March 28th, 2024, live in Washington, D.C. edition. I'm David Cast of CityCast. I'm David Plotz of CityCast. <laughs> also David Cast. All right. I've absorbed CityCast so much into my identity that I've changed my name. Uh, oh, deep into the red bud. <laughs> How many drinks did you have? Just, just the half light beer. We are at the Hamilton Live in downtown Washington, D.C., blocks from the Biden White House, also blocks from one of the many, many courthouses where Donald Trump may go on trial. We're in front of a packed house of beautiful Washingtonians. If you were going to go to a dance of democracy, you would want to take one of these beautiful Washingtonians as your waltzing partner. And I am joined on stage by my fellow GabFest hosts to my far left. When he heard we were going to be live at the Hamilton, he gave me and Emily the most eloquent disquisition on a lesser known founding father named Hamilton Pennyworth. From CBS Prime Time, the greatest export of Washington, D.C. since Marvin Gaye, John Dickerson. <laughs> to my left, never indicted, never convicted, <laughs> guilty only of being the most brilliant person in any room she walks into, Emily Bazelon of the New York Times Magazine and Yale University Law School. <laughs> this week on the GabFest, could this Supreme Court make a ruling that wonder of wonders actually protects abortion rights? Then Donald Trump's first criminal trial date is set. We'll talk about the Republican candidate's busy legal week and the storm that engulfed NBC when it tried to hire RNC chair Rona McDaniel. And then new studies find that Americans are getting unhappier really quickly, largely because Americans under the age of 30 are suddenly miserable. What is going on? Plus, we're going to have cocktail chatter and a really double extra special surprise cocktail chatter on top of the cocktail chatter. Yeah. Don't leave early. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. Don't leave after communion. It is Ryan here, and I have a question for you. What do you do when you win? Like, are you a fist pumper, a woo -er, a hand clapper, a high-fiver? I kind of like the high-five, but if you want to hone in on those winning moves, check out Chumba Casino. At ChumbaCasino.com, choose from hundreds of social casino-style games for your chance to redeem serious cash prizes. There are new game releases weekly, plus free daily bonuses, so don't wait. Start having the most fun ever at ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. BGW. Void or prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus. The Supreme Court heard arguments Tuesday in arguably the most consequential abortion case since Dobbs, and certainly the one that has the greatest capacity to disrupt how abortion is provisioned in the United States. It concerned, I'm going to say it, mifeprestone. Is that, did I say it That's correctly? Excellent. Emily? Good job. One half of the two drug combination used for medication abortion. A group of doctors sort of C confected together by anti-abortion organizations, sued to limit the prescribing of mifeprestone and sought to ban telemedicine prescriptions for it and to reduce the amount of time that you, if you found yourself pregnant, that you could get a medication abortion. Uh, the doctors had found a favorable audience when the first judge they went to, they went to Amarillo, Texas, because they knew they would get a favorable ruling from a federal court judge there. Um, and then they also found a pretty favorable, or somewhat favorable ruling in the Fifth Sec Circuit. But the Supreme Court, Emily, seemed skeptical. Yeah. So, I mean, this case is kind of crazy on several fronts. Um, first of all, it's a challenge to the FDA's authority to regulate drugs. The FDA says and did follow its normal process for drug approval. And so... Just the sort of basic merits, the courts would have to find that the FDA's actions in allowing mail order, mifepristone, and the other changes David mentioned were arbitrary and capricious. That's the legal um, 
kind of phrasing, and and it's supposed to mean that it's a high bar, that when agencies take a reasonable action, that their um, regulations stand, and the idea is they're the ones with the expertise, and they're the ones who Congress said are supposed to make these decisions. So one uh, kind of adjunct to this case is that Big Pharma is very worried about it and actually submitted a really clear brief saying like, hey, wait a second, this is not just about mifepristone, it's about all drugs. We need to be able to rely on the FDA as the national authority to make these decisions and this could really undermine the whole industry. Um, yeah. So and then the other kind of fundamental tension in this case is that the doctors um, were, the Fifth Circuit and the district court judge said, yes, you can bring this case. You have what's called standing. But they, the reason that the Supreme Court was very skeptical that actually the doctors are the right ones to challenge the regulation is that they only could describe kind of hypothetical speculative harms. So a few of them are um, ER doctors or OBGYNs, but none of them described actually having a crisis of conscience because they had to complete somebody's abortion or had to do any kind of medical care coming out of um, someone who had taken abortion pills and having serious complications. And I think the reason the harm was so speculative is that these pills are very safe. There's so much evidence that people can take them safely, that they're much safer than Viagra, for example. Um, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists has likened them to taking ibuprofen. And so it was really hard to find doctors who could say that we're directly affected. Um, and I think Katanji Brown Jackson, Justice Jackson, did a really good job of saying, okay, even if we accept that you somehow have standing, there's a real mismatch here between what you're asking for as a remedy, which is to take away mail order access from women from the whole country, instead of like, well, wait a second, you can just make a decision based on federal law that protects people from having to do things against their conscience, wouldn't that solve your problem? And I don't think Aaron Hawley, the lawyer for the um, anti-abortion physicians, Josh Hawley's wife, I don't think she had a good answer for that. And I think it looked like at least seven justices were very skeptical of her argument. No, I... I em Emily, can you... I asked you about this earlier today, and you, you've batted me down, but we've heard so much about Chevron deference, which is this concept, um, th this, this tradition or this... this this idea in American law that the justices are, don't like. They are tired of so much respect being granted to our federal bureaucrats. They're tired of federal bureaucrats making decisions about what laws mean. And yet here we have a case where it seems like the justices are going to be like, yes, the FDA should be given deference for their decision. Why is this not, why are they not as skeptical of, def of, uh, of, of these uh, well, bureaucrats as they normally are. So Chevron deference kicks in when there's a lawsuit arguing that a statute is ambiguous and that and that the, the rule of Chevron is that when a piece of legislation is not entirely clear, then courts defer to the reasonable interpretation of the agency. There's no Chevron claim here because there's no unclear statute. It's just like the FDA doing its normal old thing of deciding when drugs are safe and under what circumstances. It's why it exists. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, this is the FDA's very basic role and authority. And so all that it's doing is like the most usual set of processes under the Administrative Procedures Act, which is like the constitution of agencies, like the New Deal era law that tells us how agencies are supposed to run. There is no ambiguity here um, for a Chevron claim. The, the, there's Everyone's feeling very smug on the left about how it's so absurd they could find standing these doctors. It's ridiculous that they could think the, these doctors have standing. You know, they clearly were drawn together just to make a fake organization in Amarillo and they targeted this one judge and it's all it's all just a bogus claim but this supreme court has found standing in absurd cases and they have like refused to find standing in absurd cases why is it so crazy to think that they might grant why why would they in this case not choose to give these guys standing so because they've given a wor they've given worse plaintiff standing well the thing about standing those remember like the original critique of standing comes from conservatives because right. when you go back to the 70s you have the 
famous standing cases, the Sierra Club and other environmental groups trying to litigate on behalf of protecting wilderness or protecting the environment. And there's this famous opinion about, like, you can't have standing for the sake of the trees. Um, so when it was public interest groups on the left who were trying to expand access to the courts to try to get their liberal um, agenda more support, conservatives were the one who were trying to close the door to the courts. And so the doctrine of standing is old. It's not, I mean, it's a mess. There are all kinds of exceptions to it. Um, it's hard to say anything like really definitive, but because of that past skepticism, um, there's a lot of law that suggests that you have to have a traceable, redressable, concrete injury that you can say, like, this is what happened to me, and if I win, it's going to be remedied. And that's just really hard to see how you get there from this set of facts. Uh, two questions. The first is, um, well, on this question, didn't, did Gorsuch, Gorsuch ask a question that was essentially, what if my conscience is bruised by this? Or if, I, if by watching this, it does harm to me? Um, is that a, what's the term of art that he used? He used some special term of art for that condition, but essentially, if, uh, if by going forward it bruises my conscience, has that ever been used before successfully in making a claim? Yeah, I mean, conscience, in like the idea that you shouldn't be asked to do a task, to take right. an action that um, goes against your conscience, that's like a very serious idea in federal law, right? But what if just... Like being You're a part of a profession that's allowing this. Yeah, like, I don't think that my... did not seem like something that could get you to standing. And I actually think Gorsuch was skeptical for another reason. Gorsuch really doesn't like nationwide injunctions. So when you go back to Judge Kaczmarek, the district court judge in Amarillo, he issued this sweeping nationwide ruling that was going to limit access to Mifepristone. Gorsuch thinks this is the, a bad idea. And so that came across also really clearly in his questions. Which is my second question. Would the judge shopping rules, which are in place or have been suggested, have s stopped this if they were in place beforehand? And so would Gorsuch be in favor of those judge shopping restrictions because of what you just said? Yeah, I mean, the Judicial Conference of the U.S. Um, just, well, first it seemed like they were getting rid of judge shopping. And then I think they realized that they didn't quite have the power to do that, that there was a federal statute that suggested they couldn't tell all the federal districts around the country how to allocate cases. So now those rules are advisory. We'll see what happens in Texas. It's a really specific situation where all the cases are very predictably going to Cax Marks, Chambers, and Amarillo. So Emily, if the, if the Supreme Court ends up rejecting this case because of standing, does that mean that the substance of it can still come back in some other fashion? Yeah, it could. I mean, one thing that another very striking part of this case is that the abortion opponents could not find a single person who've taken these drugs who said that she was harmed by them. Um, you would think if they were really risky and dangerous, you'd be able to find one person in the whole country. Now, that case could come back. Like, that person... I, the government did not concede that that person would have standing either. The government said, well, that person could bring, you know, a lawsuit for damages against the drug company. But, but one thing that was bothering Justice Thomas and Alito was this idea that, well, who does have standing? And the government, uh, the Solicitor General did not come up with an answer. But yes, I mean, someone who actually took the drugs and said they were harmed could have standing. You'd ha I think you still have to show that these rule changes are the reason for your injury. But if you received the pills through a mail order and you said that something went wrong, like maybe you would have standing. Right. Wouldn't you, it would require more than just harm, because if your analogy to ibuprofen stands, when people get hurt by ibuprofen, it right. would not be a single person getting harmed. You'd have to show that something was wrong with the FDA process that caused greater harm, right? Right. That's why the Solicitor General wasn't willing to concede, well, like any patient who has a complication can come back but and sue. It did make me wonder, the, the Thomas and Alito questioning, whether if there's some drug which is causing a lot of problems, what is the redress that citizens have? And I, I mean, usually you have a damages claim against the companies and then the FDA comes under pressure to go back and reinvestigate, right? Because the FDA is like, uh-oh, we thought this was okay and it's not. And, you know, frankly, I mean, Mifepristone is was very tightly regulated when it was approved in 2000, mostly because it was an abortion drug. There was never evidence that it was really dangerous. There, They've been 
very cautious and slow about removing the restrictions. Do, so, do you, do you guys think, John? Do you think that if there's a Trump presidency or a future Republican presidency, that they would pressure the FDA to change these rules? Because it, because yes. the, when there was a Trump FDA, they did not allow the telemedicine. Well, yeah. So. Well, right. So when there was a Trump FDA, they did not change the rules for telemedicine. They did, however, allow a generic manufacturer called GenBioPro to start selling Mifepristone, which was important because there had only been one company. Now there are two. So they expanded access on that front. But I absolutely think, you know, now this issue, abortion pills through the mail, the FDA's authority is like, in the headlines. It was, no one was going to, it just didn't have the... Um, you know, valence to like become a thing the last time Trump was in office, but now it is absolutely a thing. Two thirds of the abortions in the country are now um, abortion pills. So you're saying they would do something specific at the FDA? Yeah, they would. The they can yeah, they would. The FDA yeah. commissioner would be like, "Oh, we don't think we think it's important that you have an in-person consultation. Yeah. Yes. There will be no more telemedicine, right. yes. which would be a huge change because there would then be no more shipping into." into red states, right. into, into states it's where abortion is banned, right? Still, well, I mean, FD, the FDA, it, the red states are still making it illegal to ship in. The reason that some American doctors are shipping into the red states is because the blue states are offering them some legal protections. But you're right. If it but, was, But the if doctors in order, the blue states could no longer prescribe without seeing the patient, which they couldn't see. Yes, the doctor... No, it would end... I mean, it would end legal mail order. It would end it for everybody. It would be national. It would be... I wouldn't be able to get it in Connecticut mailed from Connecticut. Like, it would be gone. I mean, there would still be a very robust underground market, don't get me wrong, but the legal part would end. And that would be a huge deal. And yes, absolutely. I mean, the FDA would have to go through process to um, roll back its rules. But this is only a change that was made, I think, in 2021. So, yeah, that could all happen. As a political matter, don't you think that would be, in addition to a national abortion ban at 15 weeks or whatever Trump has said, it would seem to me that this danger would be something that you were going to hear a lot from President Biden about. Yes. I mean, this is, the in FDA, my view, this the is FDA it. Point this in the Postal Service, right? Because if the Postal Service decided to stop mailing, that would also be a problem. And one thing that came up in argument from Justice Thomas and Justice Alito is the Comstock Act, which is this law that's on the books from 1873, which appears to make it a crime to mail anything associated with abortion through the mail. And that law is sitting there. It hasn't been enforced in 100 years. There are some lower court decisions suggesting that it doesn't really exist anymore, but it it exists. And it's not a secret anymore. And so that's another thing that's really um, up for grabs with the election. Before we came out, Emily said, I must remember to mention the Comstock Act. And so the fact that she did, I just want to recognize as a moment of personal celebration. (laughs) John, let's wrap on sort of the political implications of this, which is that if there's a, as it seems to be, a sort of decision that is supportive of keeping Mifeprestone access uh, uh, available by mail and at 10 weeks, um, a win for abortion rights supporters, is there a political impact at all on the election, do you think? I don't, well, I think that the Democrats' argument is that the forces of a new Republican president or a new Republican senator or a new Republican um, um, group of officials at the FDA are going to not stop. That they've seen with Dob- the Dobbs decision and then in a variety of different ways that that the efforts to limit um, access to reproductive rights are going to continue no matter what. And so I don't think a favorable, I mean, a favorable opinion from the Supreme Court in this case um, would be a win, but I don't think it weakens the argument that the Democrats are making, which is that there is an ongoing project and effort to limit the rights. You don't um, think it weakens it? You don't think that it doesn't, you don't think as a political matter that it will, there'll be a certain set of voters who'll be like, oh, abortion rights are they're okay. They're, they, the Supreme Court just upheld them in a key way. Well, that would require all of the the other efforts to restrict uh, access to just go silent. 
And it's unlikely they would between whenever the Supreme Court makes its decision in June and the election in November. There's and also I don't... another Supreme Court co- case coming up about emergency abortions, the federal law called EMTALA. That's, uh, God knows what that acronym stands for. But it's about whether women, Idaho has a law that unless you're like on the brink of death, you don't get to have an abortion. And the federal, the Biden administration is suing over that based on EMTALA. So that's going to be in the ne- news and, too. I don't know how that one's And you'll have the out. state referenda uh, in addition, keeping it in the news. Yes. And I think that the people who care about abortion rights are going to um, not sleep, given what they've seen in the in the most recent history. I mean, I do think, David, you're right that, like, if the Supreme Court ended mail order abortion pills across the land, that would be a five-alarm fire. So in the sense that the court will avoid that outcome, probably, then that is better for the Republicans. Yeah. Right, Yeah. I mean, and, and it's 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 so speculative to say, well, President Trump would end this on January first, twenty twenty five. That's as right. opposed well, to the Supreme Court be, just added. So I mean, people are going to ask him directly. What, yeah. what about the abortion pills? What about the FDA and mailing them? He's going to presumably have to answer that question. Uh, doesn't matter. Maybe not. Do you want to hear more from us after this episode? You should stick around for our bonus segment today. We're going to be doing a Slate Plus seg- segment, which is Q&A with our audience here at the Hamilton Live. But this segment is just for Slate Plus members. So if you are a Slate Plus member, thank you very much. You get discounts to live shows. You get to come. Uh, because of your support, we've been able to keep the Gap Fest going for so many years. But if you're not a Slate Plus member, please sign up. Go to slate.com slash plus to become a member today. Slate.com slash GapFest Plus. This episode is brought to you by SAP. First, the bad news. SAP Business AI will not help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos. But it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia, identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks, and automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations so you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real-world results. That's SAP Business AI. This episode of the GapFest is sponsored by SAP. First, the bad news. SAP Business AI won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos, but it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia, and identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks, and automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations, so you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real-world results. That's SAP Business AI. Hey, John Favreau here. There's no shortage of political takes in 2024, but quantity doesn't cut it. We need a better conversation about the latest biggest election of our lives. On Pod Save America, me and my co-host cut through the noise to help you figure out what matters and how you can help. Every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday, Pod Save America is breaking down the political news that makes us laugh, cry, and snap our laptops in half. Expensive year for laptops. Make sure to check out new episodes of Pod Save America on your favorite podcast platform or our YouTube channel now. All right, we have a Trump legal grab bag round, plus a side of Rona McDaniel. So Trump got the bond he needed to post for his New York civil case reduced to $175 million. And more interestingly, John, his hush money trial, which is the first of his criminal trials, is set to start on April 15th. So this is likely to be the only one of his criminal trials that happens before the election, probably probably going to be the only one that happens before the election. Um, remind us of what the basic issues are in this trial. Although I'd love to know why you think that, because it'll de- because you could imagine what you're saying, because let's say the court says he doesn't have immunity and Jack Smith gets to continue on. Does Garland let Smith continue on? Because Jack Smith could, could start his trial before the election. Well, Jack Smith doesn't control when that trials, those trials start. The judges well, Chutkin, Chutkin could allow the, the trial to go forward, and, and then it would be up to Garland to say whether, to, whether he should whether Smith should keep going, which he wouldn't maybe do because he doesn't interfere. Hmm. Yeah, probably not on that one. But, but I mean, he'll get pressure. Like if it's, what if it's like two weeks before the election? 
Right. Well, that yeah. I let's mean, let's really stick like, let's stick okay. with the here okay. and now. All right. All right. Not the no, but I, I think they're rancid it, hypotheticals. Let's uh, go. So essentially, this is the case that says that Trump knowingly paid hush money to Stormy Daniels to keep their affair secret. Um, in, to in influence the, the election. To, in, I was getting there. Okay. Jeez, Louise. In 2016. Um, in 2016, before the uh, before the voting started, um, and, he, and that he falsified records to cover up this hush money, um, and so uh, that starts on. And this at the centerpiece of this case are Michael Cohen, his former fixer, and um, adult actress uh, Stormy Daniels, and uh, it's now going to start adult on the 15th. Adult actress, adult film actress. Oh. Sorry, sorry. You think I should refer to her as an adult film star? I don't you, know. I are don't you know. willing? Are you making a you critique about her? An adult actress? Actress? You didn't say adult film actress. She's there. Are lots of actresses are adult oh, actresses. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, this. <laughs> this. I, just a minute ago, I thought I was making a pretty rational hypothetical about nope. a case that's at the center of the presidency, and you want to you want to pick nits over adult film star or adult film actress or adult actress. Yes, it is true. That is at the center of of our democracy. Um, so, so this um, risque thespian that is involved in this in this uh, uh, that's involved in this case. Um, so what I what strikes me about this, I mean, what somebody once told me from the Trump White House that you know these rallies are oxygen to him, and what's been extraordinary about during the primaries, Trump said the courtroom is my campaign, and it was. I mean, it, in other words, a campaign stop. You could stop in the courtroom, and it was a campaign stop, and it worked well for him in the primaries. I think in the general, it has a different relationship with the voters, but also just with his psychology. These rallies are are like oxygen to him. And to the extent that he's deprived from them and obviously deprived from the ability to raise money, um, I think will take a, a toll. And that's what this means because he has to be there. I mean, isn't there a counter argument to that, which is that there is there is the belief, which I share, which is that the less Trump campaigns, probably the better it is for him as a political matter, that the more in public he is, the more he reminds people of how unpleasant he is. And the more but, he makes it a race between him and Biden but, rather than a referendum on it, Biden. But you it won't be, it, he, he'll be at the sticks every time he comes in and out of the courtroom. He, it won't be, he won't disappear. He'll just be in a different venue. But he won't be saying insane things. But how oh, much yes, he will. Insane, he's totally dick, saying insane. all the things. He's also, but not, it's different when he does it in front of a, a rally and he uh, makes fun of a, I don't know. a person with a disability. The press is all there to like take it all in. I'm not sure uh, that I... And, yeah, I, I don't, don't think that's right. And also I was speaking sort of psychologically. Right, I think no, no, that being pent pent up in that box. The aggrieved. And, be, and, and I don't, I'm, no, I don't think that's, I mean, your larger point is not crazy. Um, so, uh, but, I, but I guess he won't be that out. That is of, high praise from John Dickerson. <laughs> but I don't, but I don't it's think like he's going to be out of the gold Dickerson medal. <laughs> I don't think he's going to be out of the limelight because he loves the limelight. You know, so. Also, people think he's funny and entertaining. Maybe not the people sitting right in front of me, but people in the country, like they actually enjoy the iron, right? The performance, and this is giving him a lot of platform for that, and to be the aggrieved, wronged party. Wait, you're saying he is going to have platform? Or he's not going to have platform. I'm saying that these cases give him a platform to do all of that. But John's saying that, that he that he won't get to do that because he's going to be pent up in the courtroom. Different platforms. Okay. One's a but, platform of the rally, which he loves because it's the thundering thing, and he can go and have his free association, and everybody loves it. That's oxygen. This he'll be in front of cameras, having a platform, but it won't be a nourishing platform in the same way. The okay, all right. <laughs> the do you think, Emily, there is this polling data where people say, if he's convicted of a crime, that I will reconsider voting for him? Some meaningful percentage of people say that. Do you I think that so is a. I feel so skeptical that that's a real answer, I right? It's like a free answer. Of course, you know you're supposed to say that, but it's, it doesn't bind you to do anything. And I really feel like his supporters are going to find a way to excuse whatever he's convicted of. Do you agree with that, John? Yeah, I do. Well, I think it's it's yeah. I I don't think you can poll it. I mean, I don't. I, don't, I think people will find a way. Um, I was actually interested that at least in the most recent, um, I can't remember if it was Morning Consult, whichever poll it was, had I mentioned that seven in ten Biden voters who are voting um, 
against Trump more than pro-Biden. Um, with Republican numbers, that's they're much more pro-Trump than against Biden. Um, and I mean, by like it's something like only three in ten are anti-Biden voters, um, which means that seven in ten, seven in ten is not just MAGA. That's like people who have come to some accommodation with him, and if they have that accommodative instinct, they'll find a way to get around. And also, there are so many steps we've taken to get here, right? Like, so many supposedly unspeakable, unprecedented, um, whatever, these words become meaningless. Like, it just, it's easier to acclimate yourself to one more law-breaking instance when you've you know, we have the E. Jean Carroll verdict. We have the civil verdict in New York. Like, in some ways, especially the New York trial, you could argue has much lesser penalties because the chances of him going to jail from those charges are slim. And then it'll be a financial penalty, which is not going to be anywhere near the scale of the New York civil is judgment it, he already has, presumably. The chance of him going to jail are slim because why? I mean, it just, it's this. It's, I don't want to, I've, I've gotten a little less skeptical of this set of charges, but. It's falsifying business records, which would normally be a misdemeanor, raised the level of a felony because of an election influencing charge, which is a federal charge. So there's just like this question, this set of questions that some New York appeals court is going to have a field day with at some point. And I just, it's hard to imagine that being something, if he's convicted, that um, we'll see. I mean, it's possible he could get jail time. It just seems implausible. Sound like it was like you were doing legal calculus there. Yeah, raised to the well. Third yeah, power. You're, well, you were trying to hook the lower to the higher. I right? was. Yeah. I was. It yeah. Was <laughs> the um, there is this. We read one article in our research which was suggesting, oh, all these delays. Democrats should wish for more delays. They should not want him to go on trial. They should wish for delays. Delays are good for him. Is there any reason to think that the delays he's he's been obviously seeking in these trials will? Uh, help him, will hurt him politically and help Democrats? Well, I think the argument of that piece, which I don't know, I, I, I had a, that, my view was it wasn't all, for those who don't want to see him reelected, making the election a referendum on his behavior with respect to trying to overthrow an election or, which is probably the most politically powerful because it has images associated with it and because it happened over such a long period of time. There was just testimony uh, released today um, from one of the deputy White House attorneys about the period where Trump tried to make Jeffrey Clark, the uh, Justice Department uh, attorney, the attorney general, and, and the frenetic and bananas effort to overturn the election kind of stabbing pell-mell at, 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 at different kinds of ways to do it reminded you of how insane that period was. Um, to the extent that that's what the election is about, that can't be great for Trump. And on the other hand, if, if you get a court case and it gets bottled up in the legal procedures, which he is protected by, as we all are, it can be a muddle. Um, and so, and that was kind of the, I'm not, I don't know if I buy that part, but that was the further argument of the, what we read in the research. But I believe the first part, which is that it's not great for Donald Trump to have all of this stuff, to have the election be a referendum on all of that stuff. I mean, it's not a it's, it, should he be rewarded for this behavior? And if the election is framed that way, I think that's not so good for I him. I mean, certainly it's chaos, right? And we didn't even know the half of the chaos. Like, if we had understood, I think about that a lot. Like, what if we had known what was going on behind the scenes between November and January 20th? It would have been completely terrifying. And it's not just what happened in the past. His patterns are so consistent um, that this is a promise for what he will do in the future. Yes. That um, the the disregard for the rule of law, the disregard for verifiable facts, and the treating a free and fair election like some trinket, those aren't just about something that happened in the past. Those are all the necessary requirements to adjudicate any difficult issue in a democracy. And if you have somebody who's proven themselves and promised to not abide by those three things... <laughs> that's not the way you're supposed to run a railroad and it's going to lead to chaos and it's going to lead to disorder in the future. What did you think of the New York appeals court lowering the amount for the securing his bond for his appeal in the civil judgment case? I mean, I, we talked about this last week. I thought it was perfectly reasonable. I thought it was, I thought they'd put him in a position that seemed, look, I have no 
brief for Trump. I have no patience for him. But they put him in a position which, because of the nature of his fortune, was kind of untenable, that he was going to have to dis, you know, disassociate him, sell some assets, or put really penalize himself before he actually got a, a final verdict on this. And it seemed like $175 million plus he can't really sell his real estate seems like a way of, of holding to him, him to account, but not irrevocably punishing him. So I know that's the right answer. And yet there was this moment when I was looking at the headline about that. And it was right next to the headline of this like Trump media company started with this wildly inflated value, which if he is president becomes this obvious, um, you know, place where foreign everybody can just like come in and buy influence. And I was like, wait a second, what is happening? Like this guy yet again is not being, I mean, I, it's still $175 million bought. I, I see that, but still like there are, there the consequences in the legal system are being moderated for him as he is also like, at least on paper, I know it's fake, but on paper, like a gazillionaire again. Yeah. There's just, and that company just seems so problematic from the point of view yeah. of a right. theoretical presidency. Right, right. It does. Um, and, to- and, and his, you know, those who want him to do well in life can just jack that stock up as a way of kind of in kind donations. Absolutely. Can, can we end this topic by talking about how the libs can't stand to hear any challenges to their crazy lefty ideas and Rona McDaniel. So Rona McDaniel, the RNC chair had her contract canceled by um, NBC NBC. because there was a full staff rebellion at NBC. Um, John, this is your world. Why you obviously need to get people who support Donald Trump and support Donald Trump's ideas to come on shows that it's important that they'd be able to speak right. and that the country hears their ideas. Why is putting Rona McDonald, McDaniel on a contract right. different than having Rona McDaniel come on Face the Nation as a guest? So many different questions, so many different threats to this. I think the biggest thing is that a news organization has an obligation to have people on to talk about what's the best COVID policy, but they have no obligation to hire an anti-vaxxer. So this is somebody who... who who supported, so I was talking about those three things earlier that I think are the component parts of a functioning democracy. One is a belief in free and fair elections, one is a belief in the rule of law, and one is the belief in verifiable facts. She supported the idea, the lie, that the last election was stolen. She said that the attack on the Capitol was, was, um, was legitimate political discourse, and both of those are lies. So she engaged in all three of those things. We are in the democracy protection business in this sense. We want to provide as much clean, clear information for people so they can make their choice about their lives and about who's going to lead them. Just in in the health context, we want to provide people with the best clean and clear information so they can make a decision about whether to get a vaccination or not. But uh, in so and so in doing that, lies cloud the window, lies cloud the effort. And so to hire somebody who is engaged in lying undermines what your core job is. And I think what they lost the plot, the, the journalists didn't lose the plot, but the, the executives lost the plot in a, in a way that's highly dangerous and doesn't have anything to do with Ron and McDaniel because it represented a misunderstanding of what's at stake in the election and what our role is. And I think it also put in a broader way more emphasis on the campaign than on the presidency. So the tactics, the maneuvering, the, the, all the money raising and fundraising and all the internal TikTok of the game of politics, which is um, much less important than the role of the presidency, what they do, what's at stake. I mean, this is, these are extraordinarily dangerous times um, at home and abroad with complicated questions. And, and just hiring somebody to, to talk about what's happening over here and then to hire somebody to talk about what's happening over here who is a known liar is um, is just totally antithetical to what your job is. And so the journalists who are in the business of trying to get this part right, and we mess up getting this part right all the time, um, either because we're too vain or we're too proud or we're just not talented enough or it's super complicated, it's hard enough on our own. So now, having said all of that, going to your question about what's the difference between interviewing um, the former RNC chair and having her on as a, a, a paid guest, 
I've already made the point about the paid guest. What was really interesting is what what she di- what she disclosed in the course of the interview, which could have been done without having to pay her. Although, as Chuck Todd pointed out, maybe the fact they were paying her got the actual honest answers, which makes truth look like something transactional. You which mean under- the interview she did with Kristen Welker? With Kristen on Welker on Meet the Press. Um, but but because she was more honest in this new role. Chuck's point was, wait, is truth just transactional and therefore you've undermined truth by making it something you only get when you pay for it, that it's not an immutable thing that we should always... So, But what did she say? She said, well, I supported the idea that the election was stolen because I was taking one for the team. So when George Washington left the office, he said, I am worried about one thing. Well, he's worried about many things, but a big thing he was worried about was the idea that p- factions, political parties, would cause people to care more about the party than about the country. That was his big warning. And what does, he didn't use this phrase, but he would have said, I would be really worried if someday somebody did this thing that harmed the country and then tried to excuse it by saying, I just took one for the team. That's doing, that's taking it for the faction instead of doing what's right by the country. And if that's the way, our politics works, and it sometimes often is, but we're at a moment where we can't afford that. So here's my... Thank you for that. Here's my question about this whole affair at McDaniel. Who, so I also felt like it was confusing that they wanted her. She'd just gotten pushed out of the RNC, so why was she... Well, you could imagine... Imagine this. She gets pushed out and she says, let me tell you about the fake True. electors. Because I was there. And I was like, while we were faking the electors, let me tell you. And we went and we got the Xerox machine and we used... You can imagine her being a fact witness to the crucial key things that happened and that will happen in the future um, instead of... So, that, I'll stop That's there. true. I suppose you could imagine that. But if you're hiring her because she's supposed to be a voice for Trump voters and for the country to understand, and then it seems odd since he had just pushed her out. But I, it is leaving me wondering, who are they supposed to hire? Like... Who is the Trump-identified analyst who is not a problem on all three of the fronts you raised? And they are, and it's vital. I mean, you can't write off millions and millions and millions of people in the country. You can when it comes to trying to use violence to overthrow an election, obviously. But um, but understanding people's fears and concerns about why they've been left out of the American dream and why he can appeal to them is important because it's something that's happening in our country, and he may very well be president again. But the problem is that, and, and um, the Washington Post had a story Wednesday about RNC officials being asked, do you think the election was stolen? Right. Um, and that's you did get a job. Like a you job couldn't get a job interview. at the RNC. Yeah, right. it's a job interview question. It just left me thinking, like, wait a second, who is going to pass the democracy protection business test? Who can actually credibly represent this point of view? Like, it does seem like there's a Venn diagram, and I'm not sure who is going to be in it. Okay, we're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back. There were dismal, dismal results from the Gallup World Happiness Report, where the United States... Well, dismal results for the Americans, not so much for the Danes. The U.S. is now... Or the Estonians. Estonians are really... Estonia's great. Exactly. But there was only like a million of them. Uh, The U.S. is now the 23rd happiest country in the world. We dropped out of the top 20 for the first time ever, and it is for a particular reason. Americans under 30 are shockingly unhappy. They are 62nd in the world behind Guatemala and Brazil. So what is happening, Emily? Why are young Americans so anxious and unhappy? Uh, They're also anxious in addition to being unhappy. Right, now we can blame the youth for one more thing. They've dropped us out of the happiness index internationally. Um, I mean, look, I think that this statistic is coming out at the same moment that a lot of evidence or a kind of growing pile of evidence about kids and how moving toward this very phone-based culture and set of relationships has making people miserable, that their rates of depression and anxiety in particular are much higher than previous generations. And it's just a way in which it feels like we have a generation of kids who you know, especially with the kind of blight of COVID and only the recent rear view mirror are living more isolated lives that are tied to screens in a way that's just not conducive to people feeling good about their lives. Right. And, and they do, it's true. They don't drink. They don't have sex. They have fewer friendships. They don't go out. They don't right. go out. Right. They spend more time alone. 
Right. None of those things are actually good for you. And it does feel like we kind of handed them over to these huge corporations um, who are really good at addicting them to a technology that doesn't actually make them feel good. The, how much of this do you guys think we should really blame on social media? How much is it on the device itself? Is it, is it, it, and, is, and when it comes to social media, is it that it's the time spent on it? Is it that the interactions are poisonous? Is it that it holds you up to a standard that you can never meet and so you're always feeling bad about yourself? Or it's just like all of those things or all at once? Well, the machines, I mean, the, the, and that it robs you from actual interactions. And Yes, yeah, sorry. Right. Yeah, but, yeah, but, the, but, that, the but that opportunity cost of humanity. Right. So that the question then is how much of that is, um, let's imagine you had no access to social media, but if you were just watching YouTube videos all day, would you kick yourself out of the house and go hang out with your friends more than you would if you were, if you were on social media? So I don't know, which is I think the line you're trying to draw, how much of it is social media and how much it is just these glowing screens in our pockets. I mean, I think especially for girls, the data shows that the comparative nature of social media is really damaging, that you just spend a lot of time worrying that you're not measuring up, that other people are having a better time, are better at whatever is has a lot of currency for teenagers. And I mean, I just, I can't imagine how I would have survived. Like, it was hard enough when you were just having face-to-face -face interactions, and then you came home from school and you got a break for 12 hours, right? Now it's constant, and there are all these measures that are so appearance-based. It's kind of terrifying to me. And also the extent to which I think this is true, that your expectations, whether they're appearance-based or what life is supposed to be like, and the accumulative and acquisitive route to happiness through products is so much more a part of your daily life. And therefore, your expectations about happiness are unachievable and that's fed to you all day long. And if disappointment is, is, is the distance between expectation and reality, you're constantly feeling that distance. Yeah. Right. But, I mean, we know there's like really good evidence about what peop makes people happy. It's clear like close human relationships make people happy. Physical activity makes people happy. Nature. Uh, nature. Outside. Being in nature makes people happy. Um, uh, lots of lots of uh, 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 meaningful work makes people happy. Um, faith makes people happy. So these are, we know there, there's there's really strong good evidence about what makes people happy, and yet we have this generation of unhappy kids. So how do we take that and apply it to them? I mean, I think this idea of delaying kids getting phones and like communities really coming together to change the norms around that seems important. Um, I'm sure it feels like a heavy lift to a lot of parents. I don't know. I'm I'm honestly glad my kids are old enough that I don't have to try to go organize this myself. But I have heard parents, at least where I live, start to talk about like, well, maybe if everybody in the class doesn't get a phone until ninth grade, we could pull this off. Um, because so much is it about FOMO, just the sense that like there's a group task going on that you're not a part of. If you're the one kid without the phone, then that becomes its own problem. But if you can shift the whole social norm somehow, I do think well, that, they that's would be a happier. negative. That's a right. negative, preventing a, a bad thing from happening. How can you actually get the better things to happen? But then they go together because then presumably the kids are going out, seeing other people more, doing the things that are in person that you were talking about, right? Yeah, although I can't, I'm not quite sure what that is, but I mean, because um, in the abstract, we all know what it is, but uh, those of us who are parents and know what it's like to try to like drag the kids out of, um, out of the house for forced fun. Now, if they don't have, if their phones aren't holding them there, um, but so then does it become, does the school have to do it? Or does, um, you know, are people gonna have to start getting religious again? Or, I mean, what's the, what's the venue in which this takes place? Yeah. I mean, I think all of those possibilities, you're really talking about like the fabric of community, what kinds of activities kids are doing, this nostalgia we all have for a world in which kids just like ran outside the house and played together in the afternoon without other people monitoring them, which was totally part of my childhood. Yeah. It's not do, that distant past. Do we think that, is the evidence suggest that young conservatives who are, have more faith are happier? I think so, yeah. I mean, I think believing in God gives people a sense of purpose. There's a lot of evidence that that there's helps people yeah, there's happiness. Seven years in a row in Finland, they've been the most happy. But what's, what interested me about that is that, for is, else. is that when they went and interviewed everybody in Finland, 
one of the one of the answers was basically we're um, we just our expectations are kind of uh, a like million it's cold here. Well, we're, we're just no, glad to be no, alive. All, all of life is about expectations. That's absolutely true. If you don't expect to be that happy and then you're slightly happy, you're like that's great. And if you expect to be incredibly happy and you're only very happy, you're miserable. And so it's. I, uh, I find, like, my, my, I'm a pessimist. I'm an extremely happy pessimist because I basically assume everything's going to go wrong and then not everything ever goes wrong. Most things go right. And then you're like, wow, that's great. I've been led I'm, to believe... That's been very Finnish. Led to believe that... Um, sorry, I didn't let you finish. Um, the... Uh, the uh, see, this is why everybody's so unhappy. They can't allow... A simple a good pun, pun or two. Just, to just a little wordplay. Very uh, harmless. In Finland, that would have killed. <laughs> um, in Finland, apparently, a greeting is a possible common greeting is how are you to the, or a response to the answer "How are you doing?" or the question "How are you doing?" It's not an answer; it's a question. The question "How are you doing?" is they say nothing special, just the ordinary misery. <laughs> and they're secretly so yeah, satisfied. And pleased. they're perfectly fine. Seven years in a row. And they have saunas. All right, let's go to cocktail chatter when you're having a white Russian or a, uh, a vodka, a very cold Finnish vodka. What is the Finnish vodka? There is a very... It's not Svetlana. Um, Finlandia, if you're having a very cold Finlandia vodka, you're going to chatter. And we're going to start very specially with a listener chatter. Um, our listener chatter is someone you have heard on the GabFest before. Because he is the source of an astonishing percentage of our conundrums over the years. But this is the first chance to hear him in his own voice. Phil Goldstein, what is your chatter? So before I go, Shana, you can cut this out or, or not, but I just want to say I've been That's listening. That's our producer. Been listening to these folks for 17 years or so, and they are not just the best political podcast, but one of the best podcasts, period, out there. Thank you, Phil. All right. Hi, my name is Phil Goldstein from Washington, D.C., and my chatter is about the Kentucky Meat Shower, which popped up in my feeds because it happened a little more than 148 years ago. So on March 3rd, 1876, in an area near Olympia Springs, Kentucky, Mary Crouch was outside with her grandson when apparently small chunks of meat began falling from the sky, a phenomenon for which there is still no totally definitive explanation. According to one early theory, it was Nostoc, a type of bacteria that had this jelly-like casing. People thought that it floated on the breeze until it rained, and then it would fall like hail. It had colorful nicknames such as star jelly, witch's butter, and star slubber. But it was a perfectly clear day when the meat fell. So what gives? Having obtained samples, Dr. L.D. Kastenbein set fire to it and it observed that it smelt distinctly of rancid mutton. His deduction, it's vulture vomit. He concluded, quote, the only plausible theory explanatory of this anomalous shower appears to me to be that suggested by the old Ohio farmer, the disgorgement of some vultures that were sailing over the spot from their immense height, the particles were scattered by the prevailing wind over the ground. That seems plausible, but to this day, the mystery of the meat shower endures. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. Emily Bazelon, what is your chatter? So I always have a little bit of a serious chatter. Sorry, I seem to have no uh, ability to access my fun self for this. Um, so it's almost a year since Evan Gershkovich was thrown into prison in Russia. Um, I think March 29th is the anniversary. And so it just seems... Um, remarkable that this one person is paying a price for the work that journalists do all over the world in places where they're threatening to the people in power. Um, you know, as far as anyone can tell, he was just doing his job for the Wall Street Journal. Um, and Putin's people scooped him up because that was a useful pawn for them to have. Um, he's lost a whole year of his life to this um, experience. And 
often in situations like this, I just think about how if you could spread risk and danger and um, all the difficulties across the whole group of people who are affected, it would be bearable, right? Like if we could all do one day of Evan Gershkovich's um, detention, that we could all handle that. But instead, it's just like poured into one person. One person becomes the vessel for this work that all of us do. So I just feel like it's really important to remember this anniversary is coming and obviously hope um, for his release uh, and feel incredibly grateful to him for doing the work he was doing and for all the journalists out there all over the world who are taking risks. Um, thank you. John has an extra special chatter, so I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in front of him in line. So I didn't I couldn't think of what my chatter was, and when I can't think of my cocktail chatter, I think, well, what have I actually been talking to people about this week? What have I been boring my loved ones about? And I realized the answer is pyramids. <laughs> so there was a story this week about the collapse of this incredibly far-fetched claim that there's a that this hill in Indonesia called Gunung Padang which is a very large hill, was actually the world's largest pyramid. And the claim was that it had been built 27,000 years ago, uh, and it was published in a reputable architect, uh, uh, archaeological magazine, and it's, this has now been retracted because there is no evidence that there was any human habitation there at all, and certainly not the capacity to build this ginormous pyramid. So, But let's not talk about pyramids, speculative pyramids. Let's talk about real pyramids. I have been listening to the Fall of Civilizations podcast, which I've talked about before, a great podcast. And there was an episode about Egypt, and it takes a really long time for the civilization of Egypt to fall, as we'll discuss. Um, the civilization along the Nile lasted an unfathomably long time. So I'm going to give you three facts about pyramids, actually two facts about pyramids, and one fact also about Egyptian civilization that's not about pyramids, and they're going to blow your mind. Okay. <laughs> First, a non-pyramid fact. Non-pyramid fact number one is Egyptian hieroglyphics as a form of writing lasted from 2800 BC all the way until 400 AD. They, hieroglyphics were used for 3200 years. Huh. So it suck took it, them Roman then alphabet. Long to find, they, all those thousands of years and no alphabet? Alphabets well, it turns so out that helpful. actually hieroglyphics are not just like pictures that okay. actually they, have, they were sounded out. Okay. Or we were wrong about that. All right. That's okay. reassuring. I feel better about them. That's not one of the facts, by the way. I still have two more facts to go. <laughs> Pyramid fact number two, the Great Pyramid, uh, which incidentally was not, didn't even get built at the beginning of e Egyptian civilization, it was, it was several hundred years in, is 481 feet tall, and it was the tallest structure in the world for 3,900 years. <laughs> for 3,900 years, we could not build something taller than what was built in Egypt. And the second tallest structure in the world for 3,800 and... 70 years was the pyramid right next to it. So, and even then when we finally did top it, which was with a church spire, that spire just fell over very soon after it was built. So think about that. 38, 3,900 years of being the tallest structure in the world. Okay, pyramid fact number three. Pyramid fact number two, Egypt fact number three. <laughs> Cleopatra, the queen of Egypt, Cleopatra is 500 years closer to us than she was to the building of the pyramids. Oh my God. Isn't that, wow. that is a long ass civilization. Yeah. yeah. Good job, Egypt. Yeah. John, what is your chatter? What is the hieroglyph for long ass civilization? Mm -mm. It's, like it's an ibis. It's an ibis with sort of a saggy butt. <laughs> the curse of the long ass. Um, well, since we're in the Hamilton, I wanted to tell one of my favorite, well, it's, I don't know, a Hamilton story I like. Let's just set expectations low, right? Because the distance between expectation and reality <laughs> is disappointment. So during the Constitutional Convention in the summer of 1787, they were almost thwarted. The whole shooting match was almost thwarted by a deep fake. An anonymous pamphleteer in Fairfield, Connecticut, spread the rumor that the delegates were, were considering sending to England for the Duke of Osnaburg, who was the second son of George III, to have him crowned king over this new continent. The writer suggested that the framers basically couldn't figure out what to do with this democracy thing and shared powers, and they said, screw it. We're just going to have, uh, we're going to reach back into the golden throne years of yore and have our own king. And what they did was they leaked a letter that was supposedly from 
a, fra- a, a British official, and it read, I am happy to inform you, the scheme for a mission which originated in Connecticut and which is so agreeable to the people of America, Jefferson, and so manifestly for their interest, meets with a favorable reception from the British court. So this was essentially some British official saying, we've gotten this notice from the states that they want to have a king, and we're on for it. Um, so this was a problem. Because the while, it, while this rumor was out there, they were meeting in secret in Philadelphia to try to come up with the new constitution. The Article of Con- Articles of Confederation had failed, and they wanted a little more centralization in um, in the government because the Articles of Confederation were a mess, and they needed to kind of knit everybody together. But they knew that if rumors got out in the middle of their conversations, that people would run rampant with them. So they nailed the windows shut so that people couldn't hear the deliberations going on inside. And so can you imagine like 30 to 50 meat-fed men in a room Probably smoking. Probably rarely bathed. Right, smoking. They didn't bathe much. They wore not just breeches that were made of extremely scratchy wool, but these stockings that had to be affixed with like a leather strap. I mean, it was just a soup of humanity. So... <laughs> Anyway, they sweated it out in there, but um, Madison said, basically, no constitution ever would have been adopted by the convention if the debates had been in public. So it had to be secret. Washington was so fastidious that he didn't even write in his journal about what was taking place because he didn't want it to leak. But there was this fake pamphlet out there that suggested they were looking for a king. So Hamilton um, wrote a letter to... Um, to the, an extremely wealthy Connecticut, um, basically a guy who had funded the revolution, um, wrote him a letter. His name, his name was Jeremiah Wadsworth um, from Hartford. Um, and, he, uh, and Hamilton wrote him this note. And this, just writing a note out of the conversation in, in Philadelphia was itself a, an extraordinary gesture because they were being so secretive. Um, Hamilton wrote that this rumor had been fabricated to excite jealousy against the convention with a view to an opposition to their recommendations. He wrote uh, further to Wadsworth, uh, be so good as to attend to this inquiry somewhat particularly as I have different reasons of some moment for setting it on foot. He sounds slightly like Sherlock Holmes there. Um, (laughs) It got so bad that they issued a press release, the, the, the framers meeting in this sweaty room, on the 22nd of August that said, though we cannot affirmatively tell you what we are doing, we can negatively tell you what we are not doing. <laughs> we never once thought of a king. And so it was true that a king was not ever thought of again for 237 years until a former president who tried to overthrow <laughs> a free and fair election claimed that he could not be convicted of a crime related to that behavior because he had absolute immunity of a king. Now I have to do my other thing. Okay, so now uh, now I get to do log rolling. Um, so uh, on uh, April 6th, we are going to launch, uh, I'm going to launch a new podcast, um, and we have a trailer uh, for that new podcast, and I think it's pretty much self-explanatory. In 1993, while covering the Bank of Credit and Commerce International scandal as a reporter for Time Magazine, I appeared on television for the first time at age 25. And so we have asked a reporter to come in and help us with it who has covered that case for two years for Time Magazine, John Dickerson. Did the jury get any of this today? I was terrified. Six-month trial. Uh, are you going to gonna be there the whole time? I, I'm not sure that's up to my editor. But uh, <laughs> 125 or more witnesses being called. Okay, John Dickerson. I have been talking to you ever since about political campaigns, political scandals, the evolving state of our democracy. Along the way, I've also been talking to myself in notebooks I've carried in my back pocket. I had one in my back pocket in August of 1993, as I do right now. They have captured thoughts about life, parenthood, death, friendship, writing, God, to-do lists, and more. I'm John Dickerson, and I'd like you to join me in figuring out what these 30 years of notebooks mean in my new podcast, Navel Gazing. Every week, we're going to dig through the piles of notebooks that I've been collecting, and from their entries, sometimes just a single entry, we'll try to sort out what makes a life, or a day in a life, or just a moment in the shadow of the day. We'll talk about things like when dogs walk their owners, why you shouldn't read a will on a Sunday, 
what that man smoothing his hair is up to in the middle of Columbus Avenue, and what you notice at the counter at Murray's while they're cutting your fish, and so much more. I hope you'll join me for this collection of audio essays every Saturday, wherever you get your podcasts. And now we're doing... so. So then, because uh, our wonderful producer, Shana, who is my producer on uh, this, and I should note, we've, uh, we, we've done some of the episodes, and uh, at first I didn't have Shana eat anything because I thought if she has to listen to me talk for 25 minutes, it could cause uh, some digestive issues, but she's fine. It all worked out okay. Um, anyway, she suggested, when was the first time you were on TV? We went back and found that court TV clip, so we all decided, well, we should take a look and see the first time each of us um, so we now, they're now going to play, uh, first, uh, I think I go first, um, we're not, you're not going to have to hear the whole appearance, um, but the key thing here is, uh, j- just to preview it, see if you can hear my breath, because I was so, so nervous that I was gagging for just oxygen, um, and if you, you can hear at times where uh, it's particularly bad. You, that what you have here is a cover-up. A cover-up by regulators and a cover-up by prosecutors. And I think it will manifest itself in the clearest of ways. The BCCI scandal is one of the most con- complex and impenetrable ones ever. And so we have asked a reporter to come in and help us with it who has covered that case for two years for Time Magazine, John Dickerson. Did the jury get any of this today? I'm afraid not. After uh, researching this for two years and uh, seeing it again now for a second time, um, even even I tend to get a little glazed over at it. Um, the jury, uh, Mr. Moscow went on for two and a half hours. Uh, they didn't seem to, to get it at all. Mr. Newman bolted right out of his seat, and they woke up for a moment or two, and then yeah. they went back. Why should the average person care about BCCI? Well, the uh, the state would would uh, would say they should believe, beca- or they should care, because uh, we must believe in the people that run our banks. And since uh, Mr. Altman allegedly lied to the people that regulate our banks uh, and and uh, protect the public. Um, we need to make sure that uh, that people don't lie to our regulators. You know, I'm. S- I only know about the Pentagon Papers case secondhand, um, but what I think about is that it was an important moment for the press, and that the New York Times took a really aggressive stand and was willing to sort of um, take the government on and print something that the government wasn't necessarily approving. Um, that was important. There was a, a, a sort of a flurry of stories a few months ago about uh, <laughs> doctors who prescribe uh, opiates to to very very sick patients, patients who have terminal cancers. Um, and one one of the reasons why I think there's so much interest in assisted suicide is there's a huge penalty that doctors pay if they are if they're doctors who who tend to sub, tend to prescribe lots of opiates. Um, and opiates, as it happens, are incredibly effective painkillers for people with terminal illnesses. Um, but but doctors are discouraged from giving them to patients because doctors themselves will get punished by their state medical societies. Right. <laughs> so it's, it's so excruciating. They're so they're each so excruciating. I we here am I making the case like for you know I'm a Sackler representative clearly. <laughs> Emily is flirting with the camera. Well, John, you are so you're so young and yet so pompous. <laughs> well, and your voice is so different. I know. It's crazy. So here's the thing that I notice about David and me is that we both I don't know. So it, 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 my tongue is like it's got been dipped in drywall dust. And I think somebody who watched the videos um, put these waters out here because because I was desperate for some water because I was so nervous all liquid had gone from my body. Um, uh, uh, okay. Uh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Emily, do you want to give you? Do you want to explain your hair? 
Oh, yeah. I was in... So I was just like a gal. For, I was like just a person that C-SPAN found to talk about the Pentagon Papers. And I was walking around the Washington Mall because I was in town for an engagement party that my grandmother kindly threw me. And that explains my hair, which has never before or after been in a pompadour. <laughs> Wait, so you'd been seen to by some hair care professionals. And, and then, then I went for a walk. Got it. And like okay. messed up the hair. I mean, like how amazing is it that C-SPAN, of all the people in the world, to stop, to ask about the Pentagon Papers, they ask you, who is like, if I wanted to ask someone about the Pentagon Papers today, I'd be like, who should I? I, I should probably ask Emily. Well, they were asking a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. That's our show for today. The Political Gap Fest is produced by Patrick Fort and Shana Roth. Our researcher is Julie Hugan. Katie Rayford made this live show happen thanks to our hosts at the Hamilton Live. Our theme music is by They Might Be Giants. Ben Richmond is senior director for podcast operations. Alicia Montgomery, VP of Audio Woo! Slate, is here in the house. Woo! For Emily Bazelon and John Dickerson, I'm David Plotz. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next week. Casino asking people what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kids' PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Voidware prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.